Thank you, Speaker. Colleagues, I rise today to speak to Bill S-251, an act to repeal Section 43 of the C Criminal Code, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's Call to Action Number 6. As Senator Kuchar pointed out, this is the 18th time this bill, or one like it, has been brought forward. I share his hope that this is the last time we will see this bill or a bill like it in Parliament, albeit, as I will explain, probably for different reasons than Senator Kuchar. Colleagues, as you know, this bill will amend the Criminal Code to remove Section 43, which reads as follows. Every school teacher, parent, or person standing in the place of a parent is justified in using force by way of correction toward a pupil or child, as the case may be, who is under his care, if the force does not exceed what is reasonable under the circumstances. In 2004, colleagues, the Supreme Court was asked to consider the constitutionality of this section. In their decision, they described the parameters of the case as follows. The issue in this case is the constitutionality of Parliament's decision to carve out a sphere within which children's parents and teachers may use minor corrective force in some circumstances without facing criminal sanction. The assault provision of the Criminal Code prohibits intentional, non-consensual application of force to another. Section 43 of the Criminal Code excludes from this crime reasonable physical correction of a child by their parents and teachers. Colleagues, this continues to be the question before us today. Should, be, should parents be treated as criminals for using force to correct their child if the force does not exceed what is reasonable under the circumstances? I would note the question is not, should parents be allowed to phys physically abuse their children? Nor is it, should parents be permitted to physically assault their children? Nobody is asking these questions. Nobody is asking for a statutory defense of child abuse. But you wouldn't know it from listening to some of the speeches that we've heard in this chamber. My good friend Senator Kuchar suggested that Section 43 of the Criminal Code provides protection for those who use violence as a parenting tool. Senator Pate said Section 43 permits a defense and justification for violence perpetrated against children. Senator Petterclerk compelled us to pass this bill because in the words of Nelson Mandela, we owe our children a life free from violence and fear. And Senator Moody said that Section 43 effectively allows children to experience forms of physical violence. Colleagues, the sharp rhetoric around this bill is disturbingly unfounded and misleading. Allow me to walk you through some of the facts. In 2004, the Supreme Court laid down very stringent specific parameters to the application of Section 43. Having considered the testimony and evidence, the Chief Justice, on behalf of the majority of the justices, wrote the following. I conclude that the exemption from criminal sanction for corrective force that is reasonable under the circumstances does not offend the Charter. I say this having carefully considered the contrary view of my colleague, Justice Arbor, that the defense of reasonable correction offered by Section 43 is so vague that it must be struck down as unconstitutional, leaving parents who apply corrective force to children to the mercy of the defenses of necessity and the minimus. Justin McLaughlin continued, I am satisfied that the substantial social consensus on what is reasonable correction 
supported by comprehensive and consistent expert evidence on what is reasonable presented in this appeal gives clear content to section 43. I am also satisfied with due respect to contrary views that exempting parents and teachers from criminal sanction for reasonable correction does not violate children's equality rights. In the end, I am satisfied that this section provides a workable constitutional standard that protects both children and parents. Colleagues, bear in mind that the attempt to remove Section 43 from the Criminal Code was not just rejected once, but three times. Three courts considered the matter, and three courts rejected it. First, it was rejected in 2000 by the trial judge, Justice McCombs. Then two years later, it was rejected by the Ontario Court of Appeal, and then in 2004, it was rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada. This bill has already been in Parliament 17 times and has never made it through committee stage. The hubris of bringing it before Parliament for the 18th time after three rejections by the courts and 17 rejections by Parliament is a bit mind-boggling to me. Why are senators challenging what has already been settled in the highest court of the land? There is no ambiguity in the court's decision on Section 43. In fact, the parameters it sets out were very clear. And I quote from the Library of Parliament study on this issue dated February of this year. The justices stated that the words, by way of correction, in Section 43 mean that the use of force must be sober and reasoned, address actual behavior, and be intended to restrain, control, or express symbolic disapproval. They also noted that the child must have the capacity to understand and benefit from the correction, which means that Section 43 does not justify force against children under the age of two, or those with certain disabilities. The justices further clarified that the words reasonable under the circumstances in section 43 mean that the force must be transitory and trifling, and it must not harm or degrade the child. They stated that the idea is to look at the need for correction in the circumstances rather than the gravity of the child's misbehavior. According to the decision, reasonableness further implies that force may not be administered to teenagers, as this can induce aggressive and antisocial behavior. Moreover, force may not involve objects, such as rulers or belts, and it may not be applied to the head. These parameters were not dreamt up by the Supreme Court. They were lifted from the decision of the trial judge, Justice McComb, when he said the following. Corporal punishment, which causes injury, is child abuse. Corporal punishment should never involve a slap or a blow to the head. Corporal punishment using objects such as belts, rulers, etc., is potentially harmful both physically and emotionally and should not be tolerated. Hitting a child under two is wrong and harmful. Justice McComb also noted that all the experts agreed that spanking should be defined as, quote, the administrating of one or two mild to moderate smacks with an open hand on the buttocks or extremities, which does not cause physical harm. Colleagues, nowhere in Section 43 will you find even a hair's breadth of room for assaulting or abusing a child. To suggest otherwise is inflammatory and misleading. The Supreme Court clearly stated that, and I quote, Section 43 does not extend to an application of force that results in harm or the prospect of harm. 
Child abuse of any kind is among the most abhorrent behavior imaginable. And it is also already criminal. Those who perpetrate violence against children should feel the full force of the law, and in Canada, colleagues, they do. Rather than protecting children, Bill CS251 will carry profound negative consequences for both children and their families if it is passed and Section 43 is removed. Former Chief Justice McLaughlin warned of this in commenting on the Supreme Court's 2004 decision. She said that the decision to not criminalize corporate punishment was, and I quote, not grounded in devaluation of the child, but in a concern that to do so risks ruining lives and breaking up families, a burden that in large part would be borne by children and outweigh any benefit derived from applying the criminal process. This concern was shared by the Ontario Court of Appeal, who noted that the mutual bond of love and support between parents and their children is a crucial one and deserves great respect. Unnecessary disruptions of this bond by the state have the potential to cause significant trauma to both the parent and the child. Parents must be accorded a relatively large measure of freedom from state interference to raise their children as they see fit. Furthermore, colleagues, we need to bear in mind that while we are discussing Section 43 in the context of spanking, the impact of removing this section is much, much broader. Consider the following quote. The offense of assault is defined in Section 265 of the Code as the intentional application of force to another person, directly or indirectly, without the consent of that person. This broad definition, standing alone, would make criminal any mild or moderate forms of physical discipline, including spanking as defined in this case. Without Section 43, other forms of restraint would be criminal, such as putting an unwilling child to bed, removing a reluctant child from the dinner table, removing a child from a classroom who refused to go, or placing an unwilling child in a car seat. The fact that such commonly accepted forms of parental discipline would become criminalized without Section 43 is a very significant consideration. Colleagues, this is not some exaggerated scenario raised as a scare tactic by opponents of this bill. This is not some conspiracy theory floated by flat earthers. These are the words of the original trial judge, Justice McCombs, in his judgment on this issue. Former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin echoed these concerns in Canadian Foundation for Children, Youth and the Law versus Canada Attorney General 2004, stating, the reality is that without Section 43, Canada's broad assault law would criminalize force falling far short of what we find as corporal punishment, like placing an unwilling child in a chair for a five minute timeout. The decision not to criminalize such conduct is not grounded in devaluation of the child, but in a concern that to do so risks ruining lives and breaking up families a burden that in large part would be borne by children and outweigh any benefit derived from applying the criminal process. <clears throat> While others mock this concern and dismiss it out of hand, the concern is real. Passing Bill S-251 will not protect children. It will put them and their families at risk. Colleagues, if my count is correct, nine senators have spoken to this bill before me. And while I respect the right of all senators to hold their own views, there were a couple of points raised in debate which I would like to address. 
The first was the insinuation by one senator that Bible sanctions, Bible sanctions violence against children. This is not accurate. Nowhere in the Bible will you find a defense for child abuse. None. Biblical references to corporal punishments are not and have never been an admonition for or an acceptance of child abuse. In fact, as historians and sociologists studying the early church have pointed out, one of the reasons that Christianity grew exponentially during its first 300 years was due to the exceptional way that Christians treated women and children in contrast to all of the cultures around them. Christians believe that every person, regardless of race, sex, ethnicity, or ideology, is made in the image of God. Furthermore, in God's eyes, every person carries immeasurable value, born and unborn, so much so that God was willing to pay the price for their redemption with the life of his own son. Because of this, Christians in the early church treated everyone with respect, including women and children. Senator Delphon pointed out that ancient Roman laws gave the father the power of life and death over his children. This is true. Abortion was commonplace. Unwanted newborn children were often left exposed to the elements to die, especially newborn girls. But the early church resoundingly rejected these attitudes and values. They treated women and children with dignity, providing safe haven in tumultuous times. This is true of Christianity even today, and to suggest otherwise is to misrepresent the facts. Any biblical reference to corporal punishment of children is not an endorsement of violence or abuse. Such a thing was never contemplated by the writers of Scripture and never promoted by the followers of Christ. On the contrary, Christians carry a deep sense of responsibility to protect the vulnerable and speak up for those without a voice. This is why many are unapologetic about speaking out against abortion and assisted suicide. Now, I recognize that some senators may struggle with this viewpoint, but the position is rooted in the firm belief that every human life has immeasurable value. I, on the other hand, struggle to understand why we are so anxious to amend the criminal code in order to criminalize parents who give their child one or two gentle smacks on their backside, but won't consider amending the criminal code to specify that knowingly assaulting a pregnant woman or causing physical or emotional harm to a pregnant woman should be considered aggravating circumstances for sentencing purposes. The second thing I would like to respond to is the repeated assertion that the research indicates all corporal punishment is harmful. This is questionable at best and varies according to which research you choose to look at. I would say that the closer you look, the more so-called evidence begins to break down. For example, in one academic review, researchers examined 26 studies on this topic from the previous 50 years and found that, and I quote, whether physical punishment compared favorably or unfavorably with other tactics dependent on the type of physical punishment. In essence, the review found that if physical punishment reflected parameters set out by the Supreme Court, it was found to be as good or better than other forms of discipline. In 2019, academic, a 2019 academic survey of the existing research on this issue confirmed these earlier findings. Furthermore, it too noted two substantial problems with the studies that concluded all corporal punishment was harmful. First of all, it found that those studies often did not distinguish between the outcomes of overly severe discipline and non-abusive physical discipline. 
Instead, they group them together, which provides us with no useful comparison between the impact of corporal punishment, which exceeds the current parameters of Canadian law, and corporal punishment, which is administered within the guidelines set by the Supreme Court. Secondly, the studies which concluded that all corporal punishment was, all, was always harmful, and I quote, failed to solve the chicken and egg problem as to whether severe misbehavior causes physical discipline or vice versa. One of the strongest arguments against corporal punishment is that spanking is associated with later behavior problems such as aggression. However, studies have shown that this correlation exists with every type of corrective discipline. And as one study noted, since all types of corrective discipline are associated with subsequent aggression, it cannot be uniquely attributed to spanking except in the case of overly severe and predominant use of physical punishment. Colleagues, much of the so-called evidence against spanking is based on simple correlations, ignore studies of conditional spanking and fails to compare the outcomes of spanking with outcomes of alternative disciplinary responses that parents could use instead. It does not support removing section 43 from the criminal code. But what about the question of the call to action number six, as recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Committee? Let me state categorically that the abuse suffered by First Nations children as residential schools was horrific. It should never have happened. And my remarks do not in any way diminish the horror of the traumatic experiences that the children and their families faced, and in many cases are still facing. Last Sunday, colleagues, marked 15 years since the Canadian government, under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, offered an apology to the residential school survivors and acknowledged the profound wrongs and unimaginable trauma experienced by Indigenous children who were torn from their homes the legacy of residential schools remains an ugly and horrific blight in the history of our country, devastating entire families and communities. As you know, as part of the reconciliation process that followed, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission issued 94 calls to action. Number six called on the government to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code of Canada. However, I would note, colleagues, that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was not given a mandate to reach into every home in the country and dictate what is appropriate or inappropriate when it comes to non-harmful, loving discipline. In fact, for a people who suffered immeasurably because of government overreach, I would be surprised if residential school survivors endorsed a call to action which advocates for advocates for government overreach in the lives of other families. The terms of reference provided to the Commission were to address the harmful legacy of residential schools, not to compel sweeping revisions of Canadian law with respect to legitimate parental discretion in disciplining their children. Furthermore, colleagues, I would draw your attention to the fact that the call to action number six appears under the heading of education. The context of this call to action is not to impose a philosophy of discipline upon every parent in the country, but to ensure that Section 43 is not used as a shield which allows teachers to strike a child in their care. This is in keeping with what the Supreme Court decided in 2004 in their decision, the court agreed. The corporal punishment is not reasonable in the school context, although teachers may use force to remove children from classrooms or to secure compliance with instructions. I would argue that an appropriate application to the call of action number six would be to amend section 43 to move the words school teacher and pupil. This would advance the process of reconciliation by responding the, to the need to address the abuses in residential schools without being overbroad in its application. 
Colleagues, we live in troubled times. And many families feel like their traditional, deeply held beliefs and values are under attack. You do not have to look any further than the parent demonstrations in our very own backyard here in Ottawa this past weekend and again this afternoon to see evidence of this. Or you can look to the battle that the New Brunswick Premier is now having with the Prime Minister as Premier Higgs tries to defend rights while Justin Trudeau dismisses them as far right. Colleagues, let me quote from an article in today's National Post. Parental rights are now a far-right political issue, according to Justin Trudeau. It may be that the Prime Minister didn't mean to disparage millions of parents by lumping them in with other far-right radicals like white supremacists and fascists, but that he did so speaks to his tendency to shoot from the lip. It is unfortunate that once again, Trudeau, who has often denounced partisanship while urging conciliation, uses inflammatory rhetoric which will alienate a large portion of Canadians. Trudeau's divisive language comes in the wake of the government of New Brunswick, Premier Blaine Higgs, making controversial changes to gender rules in the province's schools. The purview of the provinces. Colleagues, it is one thing to ask parents to adapt to an evolving culture by being tolerant of beliefs they do not share and showing respect to those who hold different values. But when the state begins to impose these values on those who do not hold them, it tears at the fabric of society. The Supreme Court of Canada has been quite clear that when it comes to religion and belief, the state is to be neutral. Yet today, many Canadians are struggling to see this neutrality. They feel like their governments are becoming increasingly elitist and are progressively encroaching on jurisdiction which has traditionally belonged to the family. As I said in my speech on this bill's predecessor, Bill S-206, I do not often agree with Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau ever. However, I do agree with this one comment that he made, and I quote, there is no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. I also believe that there is no place for the state in the homes of loving parents raising their children in a responsible, loving, and caring manner. Thank you, colleagues. Yeah.